counts of infants who survived the disease. So persistent elevated pulmonary vascular resistance basically is what's happening when you have a baby that has persistent uh, pulmonary hypertension. So in order for a baby to have a successful adaptation to the extra uterine life, there should be like an increase in pulmonary blood flow at birth um, in order to transfer the gas exchange site from the placenta to the lungs. Now, babies who are at risk of developing PHN or persistent pulmonary hypertension, they tend to have maladaptation to that. For some reason, it can be they were um, at risk for that mainly because of um, maladaptation or maldevelopment or because of some other disease like parenchymal lung disease, which we'll be uh, speaking more later on. So just to give you like a more visual um, picture of uh, what the persistent uh, fetal circulation had, what, what actually transpires during that is, so basically this is what happens in utero. So you can see that um, the right part is basically doing all the job because the placenta is basically the lungs. The lungs is not the site of gas exchange during the fetal circulation. When the baby is born and the cord gets clumped, that placenta becomes a low resistance and that's taken out and then the pulmonary vascular resistance drops because the pulmonary blood flow increases. And in this way, all the, all the, um, prep, the foramen ovale, the PDA, they will close um, switching all the pressure to the left side rather than the right side, which is basically what we all have um, postnatal. This is another picture of what the heart actually looks like. So um, the picture on your right is basically what happens in your utero. So you can see that the right side is bigger than the left side, mainly because of the pressure. So when your foramen ovale and your PDA, all the pressures are moving from the right to the left. When a baby takes a deep breath, or the first breath, um, the pressure, the, this increases, the oxygen increases the pulmonary, pulmonary blood flow, which causes a, a drop in the pulmonary vascular resistance. So you have more, oops. Sorry about that. So you will have more pressure on the left side, causing all your, your foramen ovale and your PDA to close subsequently. So this is what happens during uh, persistent pulmonary hypertension. This is just a nice um, uh, flow diagram of what happens at birth. So basically, with the first ventilation of the lungs, your pulmonary blood flow increases. So is your systemic arterial pressure. At the same time, your pulmonary arterial pressure decreases. And it's roughly about during the first five minutes of, your, of the baby's life. Now, incidents, so what I got was a US and UK incidents, right? I tried to look for a Guam rate, but as you know, it's very, very difficult. But with the help of my colleague, Dr. Numbang, and her and his um, nurses in the other hospital, um, I was able to get at least like a rough idea of what is the rate of babies that's actually admitted in the NICU because of um, pulmonary hypertension. And from what I gather, there's about 50% or NICU admissions that were admitted because of meconium aspiration or, pulmonary, or persistent pulmonary hypertension. And out of, out of this 50%, about 36% of them actually have the severe pulmonary hypertension, causing the mortality of about 36 to 40%. So that's quite a big rate. Now, the thing is, there's a lot of issues why. Um, it's not because it's not only because these moms come in limited prenatal care or no prenatal care at all, but it's mainly because of what um, what are the other resources or what are the resources that we can give them. So coming back to the pathophysiology, there's basically two things that the the, the uh, people that are studying the PHP are mentioning to be the possible causes of it. One is the fixed component, which is basically mal Mal development. This is pretty common in those that's uh, preterm, uh, born uh, prematurely. And the responsive component, this is common to those that's born poster or late preterm, and usually because of um, they have some parenchymal lung disease that can cause the uh, hypoxia. Now, I will just go on. This is uh, one good diagram of all the possible risk factors that, or other diseases that can cause uh, pulmonary persist persistent pulmonary hypertension. Let me go first with the parenchymal lung disease, which basically under this are 
meconium aspiration, your respiratory stress uh, syndrome, pneumonia, transient tachypnea of uh, the newborn and anaphylaxis. Malignant uh, TTN. Um, I know this this term is not very very common, but this term has been used to describe um, newborns that was born via let's say elective C-sections who later on developed some respiratory morbidity, which later on became a mortality and leads to PPHN. Now, what usually happens, and you would see sometimes that these babies that's born in elective C-section for whatever reason, they would have some respiratory distress, and sometimes these babies can be given high-flow oxygen or a nasal cannula, no positive pressure. Now, there was a study done in 2010 by uh, Kessler. He's one of the pulmonary hypertension person. And basically, in that study, they, sh they saw that infants that's given um, uh, only uh, high-flow oxygen or nasal cannula versus infants that was given positive pressure during that time developed more pulmonary hypertension later on. And the reason why, the reason being is they saw that the mechanism of this is the development of absorption atelectasis, which can lead to VQ mismatch. So basically, it's only oxygen that you're giving. You're not recruiting the lungs to open, which can improve the ventilation for this, this infant. So they recommended that for these infants that are having, showing some signs of respiratory distress, or like TTN, it might be helpful to give a positive pressure instead of um, instead of nasal cannula or high flow oxygen, just to not only give FIO to or oxygen to them, but also to facilitate the lung recruitment in order to minimize the VQ mismatch or uh, ventilation oxygenation mismatch. Now, RDS and atelectasis, like I mentioned, is are all causing parenchymal lung diseases. Um, meconium aspiration and pneumonia. So meconium aspiration, or MAS, is the most common cause of PPHN. Now, there's a thing they call meconium staining, amniotic fluid, and meconium aspiration syndrome. So these are two different um, um, diseases. One can lead to the other, but it doesn't always mean that meconium aspiration is also, it's synonymous to meconium um, staining amniotic fluid. So about like what uh, this statistic said, that this, this was usually um, in the U.S. that there's about 5 to 24 percent of normal pregnancies that can have meconium staining amniotic fluid, but only about 5 percent of this actually develop meconium aspiration syndrome. How do you define this? Usually you'll have um, x-ray findings to differentiate the meconium aspiration syndrome and meconium staining amniotic fluid, plus also you will have more severe respiratory distress for those that has meconium aspiration syndrome. Now, the other um, uh, disease process is the idiopathic or PPHN or what they call the black lung. So usually this is, you have a very, you have a normal chest x-ray, but the baby has respiratory distress. Usually when you look at the maternal risk, uh, maternal history, there is a history of use of aspirin or NSAIDs, and there's also a study about the use of SSRI on moms that can cause an um, increase in uh, pulmonary vascular resistance, causing pulmonary hypertension on the babies. So usually this is hard to identify because again, you have normal x-rays, but your baby is having some distress. So there is um, there's discrepancy on the clinical picture. The next one is the alveolar or vascular hypoplasia. So this is basically CDH or oligohydramnios. Now, CDH or congenital diaphragmatic hernia is uh, one of the most common also causes of uh, PPHM in, in newborns. Uh, but usually what happens here is there is the, the diaphragm that's herniated upon the thoracic area and this causes that lung and that site to not develop. So you have some pulmonary, component of pulmonary hypoplasia which worsens the pulmonary uh, hypertension. The same way with the PPHN in premature infants, it's mainly because of the maldevelopment or the inability of the lungs on that side to develop. Alveolar capillary dysplasia is uh, very rare, and usually um, the mortality is about 100%, so they don't really survive. I've never really seen this in my, uh, my fellowship program. And lastly is for cardiac dysfunction. So, 
sepsis or, or cardiac yeah, because of sepsis or any um, other uh, metabolic disorders. So this is just a sequ sequence of events of what happens. So you have a normal lung circulation. This decreases the vascular surface area, increasing your pulmonary vascular resistance and causing pulmonary hypertension, which can later on cause uh, right ventricular hypertrophy, even um, dysfunction. Like what I mentioned, these are the risk factors, meconium stain, amniotic fluid, uh, perinatal acidosis or um, asphyxia, so commonly for those that have HIE or hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, maternal risk factors, exposure to medications, um, nicotine, maternal obesity and diabetes, and birth by C-section. Now there is a lot of, um, yes, sir. You, you mentioned several times the lack of prenatal care. Mm -hmm. What is specifically in the prenatal care we're looking for that would decrease your pulmonary hypertension? So usually it's more of like, because uh, we don't have exactly the gestational, um, gestational age for this infant. So sometimes they come in, they're ruptured, uh, or they um, they are starting to have some contractions, so they are they get delivered at around 35, 36 weeks. But then when we see the baby, the baby is actually about you know either younger or older. Um, lack of prenatal care is comes in with the social um, risk factors as well because most of these moms either they are also taking other medications, so there's no education to these mothers, or they're there might be some other factors like smoking or or illicit drugs that we could have, um, you know, we could have what do you call this, um, giving them more education as to what are the possible risks for the baby. Thank you. So diagnosis again when a baby comes out, it's not rare that you see some respiratory distress. But the problem here is the liability of their hypoxia is the issue. So you would see sometimes that baby, like just a normal uh, noise in the ice, in the newborn nursery, or just a little stimulation in the baby, you will see them drop their heart rate or drop their oxygen saturation, or sometimes they can be like dropping their their um, their they become cyanotic. So the liability of their hypoxia and or the, uh, the presence of differential cyanosis. So you have pink um, extremities on upper extremities and blue um, uh, lower extremities. Now, laboratories that should be done are, the most important one is blood gas. So you want to see, you want to get how much oxygen is this baby actually getting. So what one way of us to find out is by measuring the OI or the oxygen index. So basically the, the principle about this, you're measuring how much oxygen you're actually giving to the baby versus how much you're getting. So the mean airway pressure times your FiO2 or your oxygen, uh, oxygen, the amount of oxygen you're giving is what the total oxygen that you're giving to the baby. And the um, arterial oxygen is what you're getting back from the blood, blood uh, gas. So you're measuring how much you're actually getting back from whatever you're giving. So the normal one here, it should be one. You should be giving, getting how much you're giving. But um, if you start getting a higher number, then that means you're getting, you're giving more than you're getting back. Now there is, uh, this is very important, especially in the tertiary centers, because they use this as a way to identify infants that should be going on ECMO versus waiting. So. Uh, but at least in our setting, since we, I will be mentioning this later on, we don't have that uh, capability for ECMO at this point. At least we can kind of gauge which ones are needing to be either transferred quickly or doing more aggressive um, management. Ancillary procedures like chest x-rays and ECMO. Chest x-ray is important, especially for those that have no prenatal care, and then you get an x-ray, you see intestines in the chest. So you know CDH, there's a risk for CDH or congenital diaphragmatic hernia in this infant, which is a risk factor for pulmonary hypertension. And echo, echo will identify, will actually give us the pulmonary hypertension diagnosis. So as I mentioned, in the echo, um, this is the most commonly used um, diagnostic modality for us to identify infants who has um, good, uh, persistent pulmonary hypertension. Mainly what they look for is 
um, the presence of TRJV or, or tricuspid encouragement and jet velocity, uh, VSD or PDA, and the PR velocity. They can also measure or just look at the septal position. So as you can see here, it should be either doming towards the right ventricle or flat. Uh, the normal one is it sh the, your left ventricle should be high in pressure. So this side here should be doming to the other side versus this way, the, this means that the right ventricle has a higher pressure than the left pushing that septum towards the left ventricle. Most commonly you would see the, the septal uh, position to be flattened. Also one way that they, one thing that they look at the echo is the direction of the shunts. So if you have a foramen ovale and a PDA, they want to see what's the direction of the shunt. So if the blood is shunting from the right to the left, that is a way to find out that the right side has a higher pressure than the left. Now, there are some studies that echo is not really um, the best diagnostic modality to identify infants who has pulmonary hypertension because its sensitivity can range from 30 to 60 percent. What is the most, um, most or the best confirmatory diagnostic modality that they've mentioned is cardiac catheterization, but like we all know, we can really do this on babies. So our best option is the echo. So, but I just wanted to let you guys know that cardiac catheterization is still kind of like the best because in that way you will actually see the pressure on the right side and the left side, and you will actually see the whole dynamics. As compared to echo, the echo is usually technician dependent. So whoever is doing it, if they're used to do it, then you will have a better um, sensitivity and specificity for it. Now for management, so the most important is optimization of sedation. So less stimulation, we usually put like um, eye mask, um, ear mask, and like as quiet as possible on the room for this infants because the more it's stimulated that it become, the more that the agitate or the more that the hypertension is worsened. There is a study that was done in 2000 published in pediatrics that they actually said that they wanted to avoid um, using para paralytics to this infant. So most commonly, what has been used is fentanyl and morphine for this infant. Um, the other one is optimization, optimal temperature control, nutritional support, and avoiding acidosis. Basically, it's just to, stim to avoid any uh, worsening or any agitation or any hypoxia to this infant. And if you need any vasopressor support, and the most common vasopressor support that has been used is the milrinone. And I'll show you like what is the uh, me mechanism for this one. The other is, is to maximize your uh, ventilation to this infant. So you have options of using conventional ventilation and or high frequency ventilation. So um, conventional ventilation basically is what the regular vet that we, you guys have seen. I will show you like the picture of what the high frequency ventilation looks like. Basically what this is, is you want it to be as um, comfortable as possible and you want to give as gentle ventilation as possible to the infants. So when they say gentle ventilation, they, will, they need higher, I mean, optimal peak and lower um, inspiratory pressure or mean airway pressure um, versus uh, higher pressures. So you want to get all those lungs recruited to improve your ventilation. For medical treatment, treatment surfactant is one of the um, modalities that has been used. Um, they see that this is very effective, especially those that have um, some um, respiratory distress syndrome or the meconium aspiration syndrome. So what surfactant does is it deactivates the meconium. So uh, it so, I'm oh, sorry, basically what meconium does is it deactivates your surfactant, your endogenous surfactant. So what this does is when you give surfactant, you will um, cut the loss or the decrease in the level of the surfact endogenous surfactant in your infants. The other therapy that has been used is pulmonary vascular therapy, uh, dilatation therapy, and this is the sildenafil and bosentin. Um, and the last one is the inhaled nitric oxide. Now this is the diagram that will actually ex explain the, their um, process. So basically, milrinone and sildenafil are both phosphodiesterase um, inhibitors. 
they just uh, act on different uh, receptors. So melanin acts on a 3A versus sildenafil on a, on a 5. But their main purpose is they want to inhibit the breakdown of the CAMP and the CGMP. The CAMP and CGMP is needed so that there will be uh, vasodilation in the smooth muscles of the pulmonary vessels. Now, the endothelial nitrogen oxy oxygen synthetase, basically what it does is it um, releases nitric oxide in the endothelium, and this nitric oxide diffuses, oops, sorry, diffuses inside the vascular endothelium that can further um, produce CGMP, which can uh, facilitate the vasodilation. So this is just a, a diagram that will summarize the need, the, all the therapy needed for a pulmonary pers persistent pulmonary hypertension. So like what this says, um, you want to minimize any stimulation on the baby. You want to give some mask and uh, earmuffs on the baby. Um, you want to always give um, gentle ventilation to the baby. So lower P, PIP, and optimal P and a rate about 40 to start. Um, and then you want to measure and you want to monitor their pre and post saturations using the right hand and the lower extremities. Um, just a brief introduction. This is the usual setup of ECMO. And I just got this picture with one of my cases back in fellowship. So this is classic ECMO setup. Um, this is the pump that's been used for ECMO. Basically, ECMO is not a treatment. It is a way to help the body recover by itself. So it basically functions like a heart to the patient or like a lung to the patient. So this is just a, a, mechan uh, like a diagram of how it works. So you have um, catheters that's placed in the, either in the venous or the jugular uh, or the arterial area uh, um, jugglers. And um, you take out the back blood, basically you put it in a roller pump that cleans it up and then it goes to a heater which um, converts it into body heat and then from then it will go back to the baby. So depending on what's the indication for ECMO, you, it can be because of congenital diaphragmatic hernia, so you want to rest the lungs, then they usually use a uh, venous venous um, technique. But if, you have, if you're using it for, because of congenital cardiac anomalies, then they usually use our, our arterial, or venous arterial ECMO. So again, <coughs> this is future for Wong. Well, yes? What's the decision tree used to this versus an oscillator? So um, oscillator is part of the maximum medical management. So if with the maximum medical management, that means inotropic suppression, um, su um, blood pressure control, sedation, and uh, ventilation support, if you don't get to treat the baby or the baby's still getting worse, then your next step is um, ECMO. Now, nitric oxide I mentioned a while ago is also one of the treatment modalities, but actually the, the some studies in the States, they mentioned that it is actually used as a bridge to ECMO. So in cases that there's no ready ECMO centers, so what happens is they start nitric oxide until they can transfer these patients to, to the ECMO centers. Sometimes though you will see some babies that get better with just ECMO and they don't go to, uh, with just nitric oxide and they don't go further to ECMO. But that's usually where, at least in my experience, most of the ones that we start on nitric oxide, they end up on ECMO. So again, what are the resources available in Guam? We have a conventional ventilator, which is the regular vent that we always see, and this is the high frequency ventilator. So we have, we also have the sildenafil. We can offer that. So we have the way to give the maximum uh, medical support for the infant. The only thing that we might be needing later on is nitric oxide and possibly ECMO later on. But again, these are things to, that we have to study, like exactly how is the rate of PBH in Guam to justify the need of getting ECMO centers here. Now, clinical outcome. So there is a high rate of neurodevelopmental impairment, cognitive and hearing on this infant. Usually it's just because of the 
significant time that they've been hypoxic, so there is injury to their uh, development. Now, what is the role of the pediatrician? So there is a high importance of a focus on the neurodevelopmental follow-up for these infants. There is actually a um, screening test, uh, for developmental screening test that's called the Bailey Scales. Um, this is used for infants and toddlers. So what, we, what this does is they check for a cognitive, motor, and cross development on these infants. So they start, them, they start checking these high-risk infants at about six months of age, and they check again at one year old, at two years old, up to three years of age. So the reason why they check multiple times is because they want to catch any, any delays earlier before they go to preschool. So it's, it's, a, it's a very um, family-oriented scale because they will, they will involve the family, they will ask questions about what can the, the, uh, the child do at home that usually they won't show during the, during the exam. And during the whole evaluation, this, um, it's a very long one, and it involves physical therapists, a, spe a speech therapist, and uh, occupational, and sometimes a behavioral developmentalist. So given all this multi-specialty um, um, people, it's very important that we, the pediatrician will help coordinate these people in the care of these infants that's, that had the, these risk factors. Thank you.